Greetings! In this video, we will be covering part 11 of CMP1002 Object Oriented Programming course. Here, we will be focusing about the exception handling mechanism in C++. The main idea about exception handling is basically handling errors. How to handle when your code generates an error. But an error in this context, I mean runtime errors, not compile time errors, because if there is a compile time error, the code doesn't need to handle it because, you know, it's not going to be compiled and there's not going to be an executable file generated. So when a normally compiled and executed uh, uh, program is working on, while he ha most of the times he's going to work as intended. But from time to time, he will be encountering some error in the situation. He will realize that something is wrong something is problematic, maybe the input is given is incorrect format and in, or in, uh, in, incorrect range. Uh, there may not be a memory enough for opening up the relevant param uh, variables. Some, I mean, other things, like internet connection, you are trying to open up an internet connection, but the internet connection failed, things like that. In those kind of scenarios, generally the programs have several options to uh, for handling the errors. A very simplistic uh, mechanism is simply terminating the program using some code like exit or abort. This is something that you can choose, but this is not a very good way, right? I mean, this is the worst possible case, like the program should crash intentionally. He should realize that this is an error in the state and I shouldn't keep I shouldn't keep going on. Um but can we make better? Can we uh, have a better approach? Another approach that especially C programmers are uh, frequently using is returning a value representing an error. What I mean by this returning a value is uh, you are going to be within a function. And the function, when he realizes that there is an error in his code, he can say like, okay, I should be returning an error value so that whoever has called the function can get this value and unchecks if this is the error value and if it is the checks the if it is the error value he's gonna do some special whatever he was supposed to do uh, so what I'm saying is in, in CC this is a very very good and very common practice because there's no such thing as exception handling mechanism in C therefore returning an error representing value is a very viable option but in C++ I think we can still do better than this because the thing is uh, I mean, the weak point about this uh, of this approach is whoever has called this function may or may not know what is the uh, this errors. Uh, what does this particular error means? So imagine that your return value should be a normally a positive number, positive integer number, but then all of a sudden you have minus one, you have minus two, you have minus three. What is the meaning of minus one? What is the meaning of minus two? The general solution is you write it. You write the uh, meaning of these errors in a um, documentation, and you package the documentation with your library, and then you ship it uh, together. And then you are assuming that whoever is using your library is gonna read the documentation and handle the errors uh, as you have written there. But generally, this is not the case. The third option is the function can return legal value and leave the program in an illegal state. So he can intentionally return a legal value so that the program doesn't crash. But some of the connections, some of the uh, variables, objects, memory allocations are actually couldn't be done as intended. So you are just shooting in the dark and saying like, I hope the program doesn't crash. Okay, this may be a solution on some occasions, but more often, He's gonna, it's gonna cause problems in the long run. You will not be able to uh, find this bug very soon, and all like I don't know, several weeks later that your ship, your product has been shipped, your code is working in actual uh, product, then you will realize a, a mistake, and then you will try to find a better solution. So that's why, uh, in my opinion, item three is even worse than item two, but that is still an option. So the fourth option is calling a specific function, sublight, which is going to be called in case of an error. So this function, this speci special function, its only job is handling error cases. If there is no error case, that function will not be called. If there is an error, this function will be called. 
So the main idea about this thing is here we are trying to differentiate between the code that is actually doing what is supposed to be done and the piece of code which is handling the error cases. So we are going to be uh, separating these two responsibilities in, uh, among two different little code bases or function groups. So generally, uh, the coder of a library, if you are like, let's assume that you are the coder of STL, standard template library. Most of your uh, functions can detect runtime errors. But when you detect it, you do not know how the user of your library is supposed to handle that. Because this is a generic function, right? Maybe the program owner wants the program to crash. Maybe he wants to open up an empty object of the same type. I don't know, maybe he's going to ask for another input. I mean, there can be many, many different things. As the coder of the library, you cannot know that because you can't predict future. Where, in which, what, what kind of scenarios your library will be utilized. But you can detect runtime errors. On the other uh, side of the coin, the user of a library may not know how to deal, uh, sorry, may know how to deal with errors, but he's not going to be able to detect them because he will not be able to go inside the library calls, inside the functions provided by the library. So there are these two stakeholders, the library coder and the library user, the main program's coder. They, these guys have different capabilities. One of them knows how to detect errors. One of them knows what to do when he uh, finds an error. So, main goal uh, here is separate the main program with the error handling part. For the, this exception handling mechanism, the general syntax is uh, as follows. So you have what is called a try-catch block or block couple. Let's look at the code on the left hand side first. Here I'm focusing on, focusing on a function called function A. It has a return type, it just gets several arguments. We don't care the arguments, we don't care the return type, really. The only thing of importance for us is the fact that after a while, within the function, there is an if clause, and if the if clause's value is true, then this program is gonna be inside an error state. On, in that scenario, what I want to write here is throw error type 1. So I just write down throw and follow, fo follow this uh, throw keyword with a class, a, an error class that I have written previously, which could be a dummy class, which could be a class that has a couple of integers, doubles, some variables that we can decide. Uh, but at this moment, when this throw line is now reached, the function A execution will stop. So uh, the program will not continue working on the function A. So it's like gonna be like an exit from that function. Okay? So you're throwing the error. But then who's gonna catch the error? For that discussion, let's go on the right hand side of the, uh, the code on the right hand, right hand side of the slide. So here I have this main, and within the main, I write the function A within what is called a try block. So I'm just writing down try, open up curly bracket, close down the curly bracket, and then within the brackets I write down the function A. So, the thing is, if the program, if the function A works perfectly fine, no error cases are happening, it's as if I didn't write down the try. Okay? But if the function A returns back an exception, an error, whatever I have written with these throw lines, then he's gonna j immediately jump to the uh, catch block with the corresponding, uh, sorry, with the same error type. So if there's error type 1, if I throw, if the function A throw an error type 1, error, then, or exception, then uh, the try block will immediately jump to the corresponding catch block the catch block which catches the same error type. And then this is gonna be our exception handler code piece. So the first part of throw is when you detect the error. The try is you are writing a block which can manage uh, thrown objects, thrown exceptions. And the catch, catch block is gonna explain what to do when you catch that, when you realize that there is such an error. 
Okay, let's have a simple example that uh, for this try, catch, and throw system. I want to first of all define an empty class called division by zero error. It's going to be an empty class representing an error of division by zero. Then I'd like to modify the constructor of the fractional class that we have built in the previous part so that in case the denominator value is given as zero, it should throw a division by zero exception. So the thing is, the fractional number, the it is, as you remember, uh, it is composed of a nominator, a numerator, and a denominator. If the, uh, if the denominator's value is zero, then this is an actually invalid fractional number. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as five divided by zero. It is undefined. So what I want to uh, check in the constructor of the fractional class is if the denominator value is given as zero. If it is given as zero, I'd like to throw an ex exception, division by zero exception. So let's write it down in the code. So first of all, simply I'm opening up this dummy looking class, class division by zero error, okay? And in the fractional uh, constructor, what I would like to do is if denom equals equals zero, then throw division by zero error. Simple as that. Note that this is actually you are making an object of the class division by zero error and you are returning that object to whoever is gonna catch this error. Okay? Cool. In main, read two int values from the user. Define a fractional object with these inputs and call the print function of this fractional object within a try block with a corresponding catch block for division by zero error exception. So first of all, we'd like to write down int uh, numerator, int denominator, let's say, stdcin, let me read some values here. Ah, I'm unable to write today. <laughs> Try, and I'm gonna say fractional f1 and comma d f1 dot print. So I'm trying if it is successful or not. Then I'm needing a catch block for the division by zero error. Okay. What should I do when I have encountered such an error? I'm just gonna simply write down illegal denominator. Denominator is given as zero. STD quotes illegal denominator denominator is given as zero. Let's run this code. Okay, five six. First of all, this is a normal input, so five six. He sees five is n, n's value is five, d's value is six. I am uh, calling the constructor. I am now going here to the constructor. Within the constructor, I just check if six is zero. It is not. Then I jump outside of this if, write, uh, call this code, and the object is being actually constructed. Then the object's print function has been called. And finally, at the end of the program, uh, the object has been destroyed as normal. So this is normal behavior, no error cases, no runtime errors of this defined type. In the case that the denominator is given as zero, then as you can see the output is completely different. The output now is, th th there is no object uh, uh, constructed, there is no object destroyed. Because the thing is, he again is gonna jump to the constructor and then the constructor will check if the denom value is zero, which is yes. The second number is denominator and its value is, as you can see, zero. So since this is zero, he's gonna immediately finish uh, the execution of this function and he's gonna immediately throw a division by zero error. So 
this constructor will no longer be uh, executed. This is important. That's why you are not seeing the SCD codes constructed. So since this part has given us an exception, again, uh, the main will immediately jump to the catch block of the corresponding type. So this f1.print line will also be not will also not be executed. I'll, I'm going to the catch block and the catch block says illegal denominator. Denominator is given as zero, which you can see on the screen. The important uh, one additional important thing here is the fact that you are also unable to see the destructed, because the thing is, since the dis the construct the constructor is not. Uh, well, well, finished its job as normal, the object is not actually being generated. So there is no need to destroy anything because the object is not constructed at all. So this is a pretty, pretty powerful thing. If the constructor of an object throws an exception, the object is not constructed. That is something that you have to keep in mind. Okay, let's have a bit longer example here. Um, so after having a lot of examples about tanks and naval ships, th this time I'd like to change it to a bit more, um, let's say, networking related, a uh, completely different domain. So I have to be give a bit of a uh, background information in order this thing to make any sense, honestly speaking. All right, so the Wi-Fi technology, the, te the virus networking technology that you use in your homes, in the university, but I'm not talking about 3G, 4G, not that stuff, not the cellular, that is cellular network. Um, this is the Wi-Fi. So this Wi-Fi technology uses a parameter called CCA, Clear Channel Assessment. This CCA is used to measure how much a wireless channel is empty. And based on how empty it is, uh, the wireless devices uh, determine the available data transmission rate. The more empty it is, the higher the speed is going to be, basically. I'm oversimplifying a lot of things here, but just that's not the main idea. It's not a wireless networking course. For our particular example, the important thing is the CCA value can only be an integer value between 0 and 255. So it cannot be a negative number. It cannot be a number more than 255. So I'd like to have two uh, error classes. Illegal CCA measurement error. But this, er this error class will have a one private value, one public value called int CCA. And I will have another type of error, which I'll be calling illegal wireless band error, which I'm going to explain shortly. Next, we will be defining a class called CCA measurement, having three member fields and three functions. The member fields are protected in CCA, which is going to represent the CCA value of the measurement, protected in band number, representing the Wi-Fi band of the measurement, and protected in channel number, representing the Wi-Fi channel being measured. So this is this CCA measurement object, any CCA measurement object is going to be a CCA measurement taken at a channel of a given band. Okay, so what are these channel band things? Uh, so Wi-Fi technology operates in two uh, frequency bands, either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. So uh, this I'm going to represent the 2.4 gigahertz with 1 and I'm going to represent the 5 gigahertz as 2. And in both of these things, there are a, lot of, a bit of channels, but for this example, channel information is not very important. For this uh, example, the important thing is the constructor should initialize the object, and it should check if the CCA value is between 0 and 255, and the band is either 1 or 2. If the CCA value is incorrect, which means anything negative or anything other than two, uh, higher than 255, then it should throw an illegal CCA measurement error exception. On the other hand, if the band value is incorrect, it should throw an illegal wireless band error exception. Finally, I'd like to write down a public void print measurement which just prints the CCA value of the measurement with the band information. Okay, so we are not going to be using these fractional things, so I'm deleting them. And I'll be, yeah, this, this this is fine. So I'm gonna first of all declare a couple of uh, these errors. Illegal CCA measurement error class. Public int CCA and there's gonna be a constructor of oh, the name should be like this. Okay. 
Then for the second e error type, illegal wireless band error. Illegal wireless band error. I'm going to say band number. Let's, let's call this thing B. And this is band number. Okay. So these are going to be the uh, error uh, classes. Next, I'm going to open up our classical main class here. CCA measurement. Measurement. Mm -hmm. Private int CCA, int band number, int channel number. Public constructor, CCA measurement. So it's going to take a couple of items, int CCA, let me call it C, int B, and int CNO. Okay. So CCA is C, um, band no is B, and finally channel number is CHNO. So the question says, in the constructor, if the CCA value is incorrect, it should throw an illegal CCA measurement error exception. If CCA is less than zero, or CCA is greater than 255, I think I, yeah, there's a bit of a mistake there, then throw illegal CCA measurement error, but be careful, this error object is taking one parameter, the value of the CCA. So here I'm just giving him that value. So I'm initializing an object called an object of class illegal CCA measurement error. But while initializing that object, I'm giving him a value, the CCA value. Next, huh? I have a bit of a defines just to make life a little bit easier. But yeah, let's 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 continue like this because they're not very mandatory things. The other thing is if band number is anything other than, I can say uh, band number not equal one and then band number not equal two. If band number is one, the first one of them is gonna be zero so zero and zero is zero so it's not gonna go inside if the band number is two again something and zero so it's gonna not go it, it will not go inside this if block if this is uh, the band number is anything other than one or z two then both of these things will become zero sorry uh, um, both of them uh, will be one so it will go inside and in this case i'm gonna say throw illegal wireless band error and this time I will be giving him the value of the band number so we have two error cases I'm checking the uh, for uh, against the first one then I'm checking against the second one lastly we have this public void print measurement public it's already public sorry print measurement so I'm gonna say if band number equals equals one std code 2.4 gigahertz band measurement channel number is channel no cca cca Else, if band number equals equals 2, then I'm going to write the same thing, but this time I'm going to say 5 gigahertz. Else, but wait. Do I really read, write it like this? Band number equals 1, do that. If else, uh, else if band number is 2, do that. On other occasion, on other cases, you just do something else. 
But do we need such an else case? Honestly, we don't need such an else case. And we don't even need this if block. The thing is, since we are checking against this band number here, if the band number is other than anything other than one or two, he will throw an exception. So if there is a valid object of CCA measurement class, this means the band number is either one or two. Hence, in the print measurement uh, fun function, I can only say if band number is one, do that, otherwise do this, because now I'm sure that this case can only happen when the band number's value is two. Okay. So lastly, in main, read two int values from the user, define a CCA measurement object with this input, and call the print function of this object within a try block with two corresponding cache blocks with appropriate codes. So again, int cca int band int channel stdcin cca stdcin band channel try CCA measurement, measurement, CCA band channel. If this is correct, if you can successfully, if, 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 if the program successfully opens up an object of this, uh, of class CCA measurement, then measurement dot print measurement. Catch. Now, we have two error cases. Illegal CCA measurement error. But this time I need to get it as an object because I the object also comes with a corresponding CCA value. So I'm going to say C E R R C error. And I'm gonna say STD code incorrect CCA value of CCA E dot so E R why is E sorry this should not be E. This should be I think C C error dot CCA. So as you can see, the error objects not only represent that this is that type of an error, but they can also carry some other values with them. So this is like a little error package. So I can put something inside the package, and in the catch block, in the corresponding catch block, I can just decrypt it, open it up, and utilize it. Now I need another catch block because now I have a second type of error, the band error. So I'm writing it as a second catch block and this time I'm gonna say incorrect band information. Information of B E E R R dot band number. So let me run it. So 67, this is gonna be CCA value, one band, and then channel number nine. Okay, so this is valid. 67, second band, and 44 is my channel. Okay. Let me give a high amount of uh, CCA value. Now he's saying incorrect CCA value of 988 because of this first error checking within the constructor because of this little check. And let me run it again. This time the CCA value is going to be valid, but uh, this time the band value is going to be incorrect and he's gonna say incorrect band information of three okay all right so as thrown exceptions are generally classes as you can see and as any class they can be based on other, ex other classes and they can have some parent-child relationship among themselves 
So the catch blocks can also utilize this parent child relationship. So if you have a base error class and then you have two error uh, classes called derived error one and derived error two, both of which are based on the base error class. Okay, so they are subclasses of the base error. If I have such three classes in the tribe, uh, sorry, in the catch block, I can write things like catch derived error one, which is gonna catch the uh, derived one type, derived error one type of errors. But I also write down catch base error. Note that I didn't write anything like catch derived error two. So if there is any derived error, if, if there is any errors with derived error two type, then it will be caught with this catch block because of this parent child relationship. Since there is no uh, specific uh, catch block for derived error two, but base error is a super class of divided error, uh, derived error two. So this block will handle the derived error two uh, error case. Okay. But be careful. If I write some other uh, catch block like catch derived error two, then he will override it, obviously. Okay. To cover this, let me continue over the Wi-Fi CCA measurement class. Now I'd like to add a couple of more errors. Uh, we didn't uh, look at the channel numbers in the first example. Now, now let's look at the channel errors. The thing is, in the 2.4 GHz, there are these 13 channels available. So anything other than that is invalid information. But in the 5 GHz, the channel numbers are vastly different. Starts from 36 and going all the way to 112, with jumping from, uh, by, I mean, it's like 36, 40, 44, 48, 52, 56, 60, 64. Then there is these four channels, 100, 104, 108, 112. What I want to do is, first of all, define an illegal channel error class, having a single uh, public value called channel. Then I'd like to override, uh, I, I'd like to make two uh, child classes, illegal 2.4 GHz channel error and illegal 5 GHz channel error. So let's first define our uh, error classes. Class illegal channel error. Channel number. What is wrong here in C? Oh, no. Illegal channel error, illegal channel error. Yep. Oh, sorry about that. Then class illegal 2.4 gigahertz channel error. based on illegal channel error. Now I have to override it, as you know. Uh, sorry, I have to override the constructor. And I'm gonna do the same thing for a 5 GHz channel class. Okay, so I now have two, three new, new errors. One of them is the base class and two of them are child class. Because at the end, what I would like to do here is, I'm gonna say something like illegal 2.4 GHz error ch let's call it err and then i'm gonna say std code illegal 2.4 gigahertz channel uh, band channel number of ch error dot channel number And because of this, uh, by utilization, ut utilizing the uh, 
parent-child relationship among these two class, three classes, I'm gonna say this. And this is the second one is gonna cover the five gigahertz illegal channel, illegal five gigahertz channel error cases. Okay. So all we have to do is now add a couple of more ifs. So the thing is, if the band number is one, if the band number is one, this means it's 2.4 gigahertz channel. In that scenario, the channel numbers should be anything be between one and 30. So if band number is one and channel number is less than one or channel number is bigger than 12, sorry, 30. But I think I have to put a parenthesis here. Wait. No, I don't think I have to put the parenthesis here, but the parenthesis should go here. So if band number is one and this this is the channel number is anything other than uh, between one and thirteen, throw illegal two point four gigahertz channel error with channel number as a parameter. Oh, again, something is problematic. Private constructor. Oh. Yep. I should write. Oop. Mm -hmm. So if this is band number one, 2.4 gigahertz band, then the channel number should be between 1 and 30. If not, if it is band number two, I'd like to use a little function which I have written previously because this function is a bit long to write. So I'm just, uh, this is a function which just checks if this is a valid 5 gigahertz channel or not. With all of these, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, channel numbers, 36, this is the simplest way of writing it. There can be more sophisticated way of writing this function, but I'm not going to be going into the, the, these kind of more sophisticated things. So this is a function which just takes the channel number and it says true if this is a valid 5 gigahertz band channel. If uh, this is not illegal, then it's going to say false. So if the band number is 2 and not valid 5 gigahertz band. So this is a good example for utilizing the not clause. Right? If the channel number is a valid one, then it's going to be 1 and not 1 is 0, so it doesn't matter, it's not going to go inside the if. If the channel number is an illegal channel, then the valid 5 gigahertz band will return a 0, not 0 is 1, uh, sorry, not not 0, not false is true. If the band is band number is 2 in that say, case, he's gonna throw this type of exception. Okay, this looks a bit sophisticated, I'm very, very, well aware of that, don't worry. So, let's have an illegal, let, let's again start with a legal one. This is a legal measurement. Illegal measurement of uh, 2.4 gigahertz illegal channel number. So illegal 2.4 gigahertz band channel number of 16, because now the band number is one, CCA value is fine, band number uh, one is fine, but the channel number 16 is wrong. Then for this one, if I say 44, he's going to be saying yes, that's correct. But if as I, I say this, he's going to say there is no such, there are no such channels called channel number 41 for the 5 gigahertz band. So as you can see, this part is now handling both illegal channel error type errors and illegal 5 gigahertz channel error type errors because of this parent-child relationship 
between these two error types. Okay. Okay. Uh, one last thing about the try catch is the fact that there is also an all cacher block. If you write something like catch within parentheses dot dot dot, then this means this is a block that catches all uncatched exceptions. Uh, we have been utilizing the STL library quite a lot during the semester, especially with the vector, with the shared pointer and things like that. And from the first semester, we have also checked the std string, which is going to represent, which is a data structure representing a string. Uh, the stand template library doesn't stop there, but it also adds exceptions, a lot of exception classes, which uh, these std strings and std vector classes will throw up in ser uh, on several cases, several error cases. So all of these exceptions uh, have a bit of an, as you can see, a hierarchy and the core class is exception. And based on the core class, there is a logic error, there is a runtime error. And then based on these things, there are a lot of errors, as you can see, having different meanings. Some of them is here, like the descriptions of some of these exceptions are here. Um, one of them that I will be focusing about is going to be the out of range exception. So we'll be focusing on the out-of-range exception here. This out-of-range exception can be thrown by the at function, which is uh, included in the vector class and the string class that we have seen so far. If you remember, when I'm trying to access like the fifth element of a vector, I can say like the name of the vector followed by within square brackets 5. But there's an alternative approach. I can say name of the vector dot at 5. But you may be wondering, like, this square bracket seems f fine, a better approach. Why should I be using this at? The thing is, this at function, if you are trying to access an invalid element of the vector or invalid element of the string, then he will throw an out-of-range exception and we will immediately understand that there is a mistake there. So let me show it on a piece of code. In main, I'd like to define int vector of size 20. And then I'd like to uh, try to access the 21st element of the vector, which is normally wrong, right? There is no such thing as a 21st item of a vector of size 20. I'd like to access the 21st item within a try block, and I'd like to have a catch block for out of range exception, where there's going to be this ERR what thing will be printed out. So I am commenting these parts out. This is not necessary std vector int array of size 20. Then within a try catch block, I'm gonna say std code array dot at 10 std and l and I'm gonna try to do the same thing, but then I will be accessing the 21st item. Then the corresponding catch block is gonna say std out of range exception. I'm gonna call the name of the object err. Then I'm gonna say std code um, err dot what. Let me run it. Now, you are seeing two lines of output. The first one says zero. He tried to write, uh, print out the uh, tenth element in the of the array. Since this has been uh, initialized like this, the tenth element is by default zero, the default value of the integer. <laughs> but there is no such thing as the twenty-first item. So at this line, he throws an exception. Who throws an exception? The vector class, the at function of the vector class throws us an exception. As you remember, this is a library coder doing it. He throws an exception because he doesn't know what I will be doing. My behavior of handling this kind of error could be one thing. Your way of handling this type of error could be another thing. So he just throws an exception and let the coder uh, let the caller handle that. Uh, exception. And here I'm just writing down err.what, meaning like I'm just printed, printing out the uh, 
answer of this uh, error. Like why there is error. So this 21, he says, is bigger than or equal to this dot size, which is 20. So you are trying to access a memory space which is bigger than the size. That is what it is. Range check. This is quite powerful. Because if you're stuck with the square brackets, let me try the same thing with the square brackets now. I'm normally expecting second one to fail. But as you can see, the second line doesn't fail. Because the square bracket operator, this is an operator, uh, does not throw an out of range exception. Whereas the add function does throw an uh, out of range exception. Therefore, if I use this uh, square bracket uh, notation for accessing items within the vector, I will not be able to notice uh, out of error, out of range exceptions, which is gonna cause me a lot of headache. Because then I won't be able to understand. As you can see, the program did not quit, did not finish, right? So that's a very powerful thing. This add function, and then how to utilize this out of range uh, exception to check if this add function failed or not. One last example is I like to try the same thing with a string now because we haven't used the add function over the strings. I'd like to show you a short example. So here I'm gonna say std vector, not vector, sorry, std string. Let me call it s equals trial. And I like to print out s dot at two and s at uh, s dot at at ten. So if I run this code, the second item is 2i, because 0 to 1 is capital T, first one is R, and second one is I. But in the second line, the program is now giving me an error. He's throwing an exception, because this fun error, this add function is now throwing an exception of type out of range, because 10 is bigger than the size of the, uh, the string, which is 5. So as you can see, this add function is quite useful. Because otherwise, we won't be able to find these kind of errors unless we just dig deeper, look inside the code, and most likely we will make simple mistakes. We won't be able to find them. Don't I mean, the codes will be much, much, much longer than what I'm showing you here. Even the CCM measurement kind of code is going to be very small when you consider a real coding environment. For the other types of errors, you can check it out, like this bad allocation, bad type ID, overflow, underflow, range, length, and there are even other things. If you want to, you can also base your exceptions on these exception, uh, basic STL exception class. It is complete up to you. You can either make your own exception classes or just use the exception class given here. Okay, so that would be it for this part. So the next and the last part, we'll be briefly covering the singleton pattern over the uh, design patterns in programming languages in C++, and we will have a bit of a shorter wrap up. So thank you for listening. I think it was, I hope it was uh, educative, uh, and see you in the next video. Bye-bye.